On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Mora is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Mora's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at moramurrayfamilydirect at gmail.com or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Mora Murray. Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance, not in the Crawl Space studios in Wormtown, but being joined through the magical powers of the internet. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing so well. How are you today, Tim? I'm great. And Lance, this is episode three now in our series on the disappearance of Erica Franelich. That's right. Erica Jane Franelich has been missing since October 13th, 1986 from Middleburg, New York. She was 26 years old at the time of her disappearance and today we have her sister nada on the uh, interview with us yeah that's right we got a wonderful opportunity to speak with erica's sister nada and she is a wonderful woman and greg overacker the private investigator he joins as well so it's a uh, it's a really great call and this is going to be more than a one-part episode this is going to be a two or probably a three-part episode um, with pieces of this interview with nada because there's a lot of information here, and this episode is, uh, well, it's, again, quite jaw-dropping. Yeah, it, it sure is, and and Nada makes no bones about uh, the fact that she wants to make Richard, Erica's husband at the time, very uncomfortable, and you can you can hear this in her voice, and you can, uh, you can almost feel her determination here. That's right, and, of course, this case is the first one that's being worked by Greg Overacker and Lou Barry, private investigators who are working pro bono for the nonprofit Private Investigations for the Missing. So make sure to check out investigationsforthemissing.org, and there are links to their social pages in the show notes. And these episodes in this series will appear on both feeds, our Missing Maura Murray and Crawl Space feeds. We hope you can understand. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. Nada, how are you today, Nada? I'm fine, Tim. How are you? Doing well. We are being joined by Lance, of course, and uh, Greg Overacker as well. How's it going, everyone? Good. How you doing? We're doing really well. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, chat with us about this. We're uh, continuing the conversation about uh, Erica Franelik, and uh, yeah, thank you so much, Nada, for uh, joining us. You, you as well, Greg, of course. But uh, Nada, you're a lot more uh, close to this. Um, is that correct? Yes, Erica's my sister. Erica's your sister, so you've been dealing with this for a long time. This is very personal. Yes, 34 years. Yeah. Did you listen to the last episodes? Yes, both of them, several times. <laughs> okay. And uh, some of that information was uh, information that, that you had given to Greg through your phone call. So that was um, very helpful, interesting to paint um, a more well-rounded picture. I hope so. Um, what, what did it feel like, I guess, to, to hear that? Because uh, that information is quite shocking. Well, I just wish that it could have been resolved a lot sooner than this. But there is more information out there. And somebody's got it. And I wish they would come forward. It's a really odd thing after, you know, for us to come across this case and say, well, let's look into this, you know, <clears throat> we just picked it at, not completely at random, but and then we contact the family and come to find out, you know, the family's just in limbo and has been in limbo for years. That's, that's a rough thing to hear. 
Can we um, go back to uh, your relationship with your sister? Is that okay to talk a little bit about the the past and how you guys grew up and yeah, just you know your your overall uh, relationship? Um, Erica, she's my sister, but she's eight years younger than I am, so I was more like a mom to Erica than her sister. Um, we had a family of eight, so there was a lot going on. Oh, I see. So she was uh, definitely a lot younger than you, and um, I'm assuming that your parents were still together, but there was so many children uh, in the household. Uh, Erica gravitated towards you, or she gravitated, or you gravitated towards her as sort of a mother figure? I was um, the third oldest out of the eight, so I was born in the middle of the five boys, and um, Erica was the second to the youngest. So I think all the kids gravitated towards me. Gotcha. And mostly boys, too? Most of them are boys. Um, I have two older brothers and uh, three younger brothers, and then Erica and Rhonda were the youngest two in the family. I got married fairly young and moved out, but it seemed like Erica and Rhonda were staying at my house no matter where I went for the whole weekend. Gotcha. After you after you moved out, they continued to stay in contact with you, and you continue to be that mother-type figure to them? Yes, um, very much so. Cool. Um, my mom and dad, um, I guess they got a little tired at the end. <laughs> uh, eight kids was a lot. Yeah. In uh, 1981, my mom also got sick. Um, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Erica was 21 at the time. It was just before her um, 21st birthday my mom was diagnosed. And matter of fact, we went to uh, Texas. Erica was living in Texas at the time. And we went to Texas in July of 81. She was with Tommy and her son Christopher at the time. And we went there to visit her. And my mom was sick on the trip. The day we came home from that trip, we put her in the hospital. And that's when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's tough. Um, You said that Erica was in Texas at the time uh, with with Tommy, and uh, this was her first husband? They never married. Gotcha. She was with Tommy, and they had one child, Christopher, and that was Tommy Sullivan. When did that happen? That was 1981. And then in 82, my parents and I went to um, Las Vegas. It was uh, September. Erica was with Rick by that time. They all worked for cable companies, and they traveled around, and then, you know, the cable people had motel rooms, and they partied that night, and she met Rick and somehow ended up with Rick. So in September of 82, my parents and I went on another vacation to Vegas. We ended up going by Arkansas to stop and see Tommy and Christopher, and Erica found out, I think she was in Illinois at the time with Rick. She decided to come home and travel as far as Arkansas with us so she could take Christopher back with her. Did she have a good relationship with the first man, with Tom, Tommy? Not at that time. And was there any sort of uh, altercation between Rick, who Rick Rick is uh, Richard Franelick. That's correct. That's who you're speaking of? Yes. Okay. Was there any hostility between Rick and Tommy? I wasn't there at the time. They were in Illinois, but um, from what I understand, a couple days after we dropped her off in Arkansas, she left Arkansas with Christopher. And from what I understand, Rick also went to Arkansas. That's what he told me. And at one point, he was hiding in a closet. Basically, what they did is um, they took Christopher without Tommy's knowledge and took off with him. I can't imagine that that... uh pleased Tommy any in any way? No, it did not. When I called home, my daughter said, Erica took off with Christopher. And I said, well, she said she was going to. And my dad said, we're not stopping back by Arkansas on the way home. <laughs> right. <laughs> did, uh, did Tommy follow up with her? Was there any files charged? He didn't file anything. Matter of fact, that was basically the end of it. She grabbed Christopher ran with him, and continued on living with Rick. How long was it between that and and Christopher going back to Tommy? 
Was it a short period? No, from 82, she she had Christopher, and then 84, her and Rick were still together. They had little Ricky. He was born in July of 84. And then in 1986, in the summer of 86, she was here in Michigan with Rick. And okay. they still had Christopher. I didn't realize it had been that long. Okay. Yeah, four years. Wow, and Tommy never came after him or sued her or took her to family court or anything? Nothing. Huh. I don't think he knew how to go about it. Right. I would just assume that someone would just call the police. You would have to know, Tommy. <laughs> okay. I, I get the uh, feeling you're trying to be polite. I am. Okay. At what point did you meet Erica's husband, Richard? They had, they traveled so much. You know, they came back. I, I don't remember exactly what year I met him. I know it was sooner than 86. Um, but they traveled, you know, state to state with this cable company. And the one thing that Erica was real good about doing is every time they went from one state to another, she always called. She always let us know where they were at. A lot of times they, we knew where she was at just because um, they needed money. So my parents were always sending out money to her. But by 86, things were going downhill. Downhill in their relationship? Yeah, they had a real violent relationship. What was the age difference between the two of them? They're about the same age. And you mentioned uh, violence in the relationship. You mean there was uh, physical abuse? Yeah, Rick was real violent with Erica. Was this something that Erica would come to you and, uh, you know, to, to seek your advice on? Or did she hide it and you uh, saw it on your own and, and made the uh, conclusion yourself? We saw it um, when she was here in Michigan, especially in 86. They were fighting. And uh, we started out, I think I believe, at my parents. And then they ended up going to my sister's house. And they were fighting real bad over there. She kicked them out. And then they went to my brother Mike's house, and he wanted them gone. At one point, he was trying to leave in a car, and she grabbed onto the car, and he drug her par partially down the road. So every time he, tr you know, would want to go to the store or anything, she would say, you know, take both kids, take both kids, because she figured he, you know, if he had both kids, then he just wouldn't up and leave her, because Christopher wasn't his. Finally, one day, he just... He took both kids, but he dropped Christopher at six years old off the corner store, and he just kept going to New York. Was there any indication that this man was uh, was was not was not well? Was maybe mentally unstable? Was perhaps a, a bit of a, a a psychopath? I mean, that sounds that sounds like insane behavior to me. There's a lot of violence in Rick's family. He grew up in it. I believe that her relationship with Rick was just like his mom and dad's relationship. Tell us about that. Um, from what I understand, the Franlick kids grew up in a lot of violence. One of them, I heard, was beat until he was unrecognizable. Matter of fact, this is some of the things that Rick told me when I met with him in 2005 and other things that I heard from other family members. Um, these these kids are big. They're big boys in this family. There was five boys, one girl. Even interviewing with some of them in 2005, the violence they told me that went on with this father that they had was ridiculous. And I believe the boys act a lot like him. So it was primarily the father that was abusing them? Yes. I've, I haven't really heard that the mother did, except for the fact that they were in the bars a lot. And the kids were just left to roam. And this was abuse right in front of the kids? Yes. The father did not care who was around. I heard he was mean. Was it was there a story that um that the boys, uh the Franilich boys beat up the dad at one point because of his behavior towards their mom? Yes, when I met with Rick in two thousand five, he told me a story that when the boys all got old enough, they ended up beating their dad up. They waited till they kicked the crap out of him, they said. I guess his mom and dad were separated at the time or divorced. And Rick looked really, he kind of looked into outer space and he said, 
then my mom still slept with him after that. So this had to have taken place in the, the late 60s, early 70s? Rick was born, I believe, in 59. So I would say, yeah, 60s and 70s. Their whole childhood was violent, from what I understand. Was this something that Erica was uh, aware of before she committed to him? I don't believe so. Like I said, they met while they were partying at night. You know, there was a lot of drug use. And unfortunately, Erica was into it too. Um, Both Rick and Erica were heavy into drugs. It wasn't going well. Had Erica ever experimented with drugs before, or was this something that Richard introduced to her? I know she smoked pot. She smoked marijuana before. And I'm not sure when she got into more drugs. Erica was, let's say, 13 and well-built. She was well-built at 13 years old. And she was on the thick side at that time. But the last time I saw her, she looked 100, she was like 100 pounds. She was skinny. And her skin didn't look right. They both were into, I heard crap at the time. And um, there was a lot of fighting going on. They were living at with Mike, you know, at the time Rick left with Ricky for um, New York. And Erica wasn't willing to let go of Rick. Um, she, Erica had a lot of boyfriends. And uh, she would move quickly through them. But with Rick, it seemed like she was obsessed with him. Um, I don't know what she saw in him, but she was totally obsessed with Rick. So when he left with little Ricky in 86, um, she called Arkansas Christopher's grandparents And she had them come and get Christopher so she could leave Michigan and follow Rick to New York. And that's exactly what she did. So then she gets to New York and things aren't going well. They're living with his family and different family members. A lot of fighting going on. And the last phone call that she made was to my brother Mike. And um, she said she was in fear for her life. So how long is she in New York between the time she comes from Michigan in pursuit of Richard and Ricky? I believe she was at least there six weeks. Okay, and then... Six uh, weeks to two months. Until the last time she's seen is October 13th, 1986. Right. And what was that like for the family when she went missing? Well, all of a sudden, um, there were no more phone calls. And we were trying to get a hold of her, and there was nothing happening. So after Mike got that phone call, I called New York. And I I don't know exactly which month I called, either November or December. I believe it was early December. And told them my sister was missing. We hadn't heard from her. And they told me that I needed to fly to New York to put out a missing person. At that time, I could not. I had just recently had a serious car accident in 86, the beginning of April of 86. So I had five fractures in my back, so I wasn't going anywhere. And I had two small children at the time, too. And um, I couldn't fly. You know, I was actually broke. I just couldn't, I couldn't afford it. So um, I kept calling the police, and they keep telling me that I had to go to New York to put out this missing person. So finally, I contacted a friend of mine that I grew up with. He happened to be the captain of Waterford Police Department. By February, I'd, I'd had it. You know, nobody was doing anything. So he sent an officer to my home, and he took down all the information for the missing persons. He said, you must know somebody because you have to go to the state they're missing from. I said, I grew up with the captain of the Waterford Police Department, Russ Carson at the time. That's the only reason that that missing persons got put out there. And then when it was sent to New York, they kept trying to send it back. And at one point, you know, my brother Pete went into Russ Carson to talk to him about it. And he said, no, that's not our jurisdiction. It's theirs. So they need to do something. So they kept shuffling it back and trying to shuffle it back and forth. It might be interesting to note that when she's last, Erica's last seen on October 13th, 1986 at the main rail, 
Tavern in Middleburg. After that, Richard gives conflicting stories of when he takes her and puts her on a bus in Schenectady that we know is absolutely false. When asked, um, you know, no one sees her at the... He, of course, he says, well, I saw her because he had to have seen her. He's, he, he's saying supposedly she's with me. But no one else sees her, literally no one. No one comes forward and says, oh, yeah, she had dinner at my house. Oh, yeah, they came to my house and, you know, whatever, or visited with us. Or No one sees her. How is that even possible? They don't live on their own. They live with other people. They go from house to house to relative to relative, yet no one sees her. And then you have that lost time frame, of course, which makes the case difficult to investigate. You know, that's kind of a crucial time frame right there initially. And then NADA has to go through this difficulty of trying to a police department to pick it up. In the meantime, they're sending it back and forth from New York State to Waterford, Michigan Police Department. It's going back and forth and back. And all this time is being lost, which obviously works to the advantage of whoever caused her disappearance. I had talked to Rick at one point, and I asked him where what Erica was. He said, we weren't getting along. We decided that we couldn't make it. So I took her to the bus station, and we said our I love yous and goodbye. And she happily leaves on a... She, That's what he's trying to tell me that, that you she know... Has she has money. Just, she has $280, which we know she didn't. She was penniless, and she just leaves her child with him and gets on a bus and leaves for a destination unknown. He says, I don't know where she was going. I'm curious about the wording that you just uh, used, Nada. The... Uh, wording being, uh, we we said our, our I love yous and our and our goodbyes. Those um, are exactly Richard's words. Those are exactly Richard's to words me. that he to you. And that's a big warning sign to me because that is not my sister. That's me. I leave that quickly. Not my sister. Right, and you had mentioned you, she was kind of obsessed with him, or she, you know, she was. She really, was truly totally obsessed him. with him. So my next question was. You know, I didn't say anything. I just thought right there was my big warning sign when he told me that. And I said, what bus station did you take her to? His exact answer was Greyland. I mean, Greyhound. Okay, so he, he kind of confused the buses, uh, the Greyhound yeah. bus, Greyland bus. Right, and then I'm going, Greyland? You mean Greyhound? Yeah. I mean, in my mind, I'm saying, you're lying. Yeah, yeah. How long after the disappearance did you have this conversation with him? And had he been questioned by police when you had this conversation with him? He hadn't been questioned by police at that time. I hadn't even put the missing persons out on her at that time. It was like within, like I said, early, maybe early December, even January when I had that conversation with him. But I knew right then when I had that conversation with him, that was not, that did not happen. Wow, so you were suspicious right from then. Was, I'm totally suspicious because that's not Erica. Erica did not know how to let go of Richard. So even if he, let's say let's say he did, which we know it didn't happen, but let's say he did put her on a bus and she leaves, you end up contacting him in like January or something. He doesn't think it's odd that she never calls and asks about her own son? She just disappears and he's like, Okay, she must not care. He doesn't try to call her. And he say, did know, not care. try to look for her. He never contacted the family one time. The very next time I heard with him was fast forward four years later. Now, I know he made a statement to Greg that he talked to me three or four years later, and um, it was four years later. It wasn't because he called me looking for her. It was because I called Rick's dad. I, he's the only number I had, so I called him looking for Rick, and he told me he didn't hadn't seen Rick in several months. He didn't know his phone number. He had no clue where Rick was. Thirty minutes after I got off the phone with his dad, Rick called me. That's why Rick called me. Must have been a coincidence. Yeah, he doesn't know his, where his son's at, but thirty minutes later he calls me. Yeah, when he called, were you like, did you just talk to your dad? Did you ask him that? No, I didn't ask him. I didn't care. I, I I knew that he did, you know, and so he, we talked on the phone. He said, um, he told me to, you know, he, he said, you haven't seen Erica? And I said, no. And he was real calm and cool, collected about it. And he said, well, tell Erica, if, if you ever talk to Erica and tell her I love her and that, I, you know, we want her back, um, tell her to contact me. 
And I'm thinking, huh? This has been four years, Rick. And then yeah, he said, yeah. um, if there's anything I can do or, you know, to help, let me know. I said, yeah, you know, there is one thing. I said, what was that bus station that you took her to? You know, the one that I'm talking about, thinking to myself, the one you can't remember yeah. or keep straight. And his exact answer was Greyhound. I'm thinking, wow, that just came right out of your mouth four years after she's missing. But when she first comes up missing, you can't even remember which one it was. That's funny how that works. Yeah. Going back four years to when you first spoke with him, I think you said it was the January after the disappearance. You spoke with him. Was there anything um, leading up to that that was uh, maybe indicating to you that he might have had something to do with the disappearance, uh, that he might have had something to do with the phone call where she said that she was afraid for her life? Was she ever like specific? Yeah, we were worried was... because we knew how violent their relationship was. Had she specifically stated that she was afraid for her life because of Richard, that Richard was the cause of her fear? Yeah, she stated that to my brother Mike on the phone, October 13th. Okay, okay so that phone call was specifically about Richard. I'm, I'm scared for my life because of Richard. Yes, and they, were, they had no money. So right. she was supposed to call back, and Mike never heard from her again. Based on everything you know now, what's your opinion on how it went down? How do you think he did what he probably did and, and got away with it and is getting away with it? I think they got into a vicious fight and uh, Rick got carried away and killed her. Uh, they had a lot of arguing going on. Um, he killed her and he hit her body. And I believe the brothers know too. The fact that she had no advocates there in New York on her side when this all happened, that when she disappeared, literally there was this big open time frame where no one's looking for her. There's no active, immediate concern for her. When you say no advocates, are you speaking of um, law enforcement or friends? Uh, she was sort of displaced from her family? Yeah, her family's miles away. So she's kind of here on her own, and uh, when she goes missing, there's no one to immediately say, you know, where is she? She did have a friend in town that uh, that was concerned, but she was kind of out of the loop. So when she was told that she left, it was it was very concerning to her, but she, she had no nothing to really stand on until later when she started hearing stories. And the stories came from people that were kind of witness to things on the periphery. The people that were witnesses on the periphery all put it together. They're not even in question of what happened. They, they, because of these people in town that were kind of in the circle were close, and it's such a small town and everything, because they all had some type of interaction throughout all this happening, they could all put it together to, to they knew exactly what took place. And is that a technique that you're using in investigating this, Greg? Are are you going back to her her old friends and sort of connecting the dots uh, that way? Because I, I can imagine it's going to be kind of challenging it being uh, a case from 1986. It is. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are just absolutely frightened, frightened. But there are people that are in the know. When you discuss this with those people, it, this isn't a considered a whodunit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because people know who did it, right? Right. It's it's more of a, a of um, the fact that this group of people piece piece it together that makes it difficult. It's it's kind of a little hard to explain without telling details that I really can't go into. But you know what Nate is telling you about the time frame of, of being at the the main rail bar. Uh, placing a phone call. The phone, the payphone was just outside the side door of the bar on the street. She talks to her brother for 49 minutes, Michael, and then that's the last she's seen. They left that bar and they went back to the family home, and there was a group of people that went there, and then she's never seen again. Of course, he tells you he did see her. Oh, of course I saw her. I was with her after that, but no one else sees her. How is it even possible? I mean, it just doesn't make sense that no one else saw her. No other family members come forward and say, oh, absolutely, I saw her. I saw her for, you know, 
this day, that day, and the other day. They were at my house. They had dinner with us. No. You know, they got to eat and sleep somewhere. No one has uh, specifically said, oh, yeah, no, I saw them. Uh, Richard and Erica were heading out the door, uh, and, you know, he said he was going to go drop her off at the bus. No one said anything like that. Nope. Not one person. Not one person sees her after the 13th. Except Richard, of course. As far as I'm concerned, it wasn't pursued correctly until Bill John got hold of it. And that was um, 2003, I believe. And he was um, a member of the state police, the New York State Police? He was a senior investigator. Just so your listeners know, if you go down in the links below, when you watch this podcast, like on YouTube, if you go down in the links... One of the links says something, something CBS. That there's an interview there on the news with Bill John that you can watch, and I think maybe you put some newspaper articles on too. You can just look those up if you Google them. But the interview with Bill John is interesting, and it's actually the the reporter actually calls Richard and speaks to him on the phone. Yeah, that is a great uh, a great interview. You can see how awkward it is when uh, the reporter calls Richard. Yeah, Richard wasn't happy. Because he doesn't want to answer the questions, because he can't answer the questions. There's no valid answers. I mean, it's just they all sound like bullshit because they're bullshit. Yeah, and that's how you feel too, Nada? Yes. I met with Rick in uh, 2005 in Stratton Mountain in Vermont, and I spent about five hours with Rick. Tell how that, that story is kind of odd, how you ended up finding that him and everything. To this day, I think about that narrow five-minute window I had even contacting him there. I was told when I went to a jail to see Little Ricky, um, Little Ricky told me he worked on a mountain, his dad worked on a mountain in Vermont. Didn't tell me anything other than that. And uh, when I was driving back with the Vermont police officer and Bill John to the airplane to come back to New York, um, You know, they stated that they, you know, the police couldn't talk to him. He had lawyered up. But a civilian can talk to him. And I was sitting in the back seat thinking, hmm, guess I can talk to him. So when we got back to New York the next morning, I was on the computer in the hotel room looking for mountains in Vermont. And Bill John came up and he says, I tell my guys just to go knocking on doors. And I thought, well, that's great, but I got one day to do this because this is Sunday, and I'm going to go to wherever I think he's working on some mountain in Monday, and I'm leaving Tuesday. And he said, uh, go up to Bromley Mountain. I looked up at him, and I said, um, I'm not leaving this hotel until I find out at least there's construction going on at that mountain. He said, okay. So he left. So I stayed on um, the computer for a while. I called Bromley Mountain. They said there was nobody There was no construction going on. They said, try Stratton Mountain. I said, okay. So I called Stratton. I said, do you have construction going on up there? They said, yeah, we have all kinds of construction. I said, okay. That afternoon I went and Bill John took me to uh, the farmhouse, Richard's family farmhouse. The grandparents owned it. Uh, His Aunt Teresa was living there at the time. So I spent about four hours with her. And uh, I guess we'll get back to that. And then Monday, I rented a car, and I got up to Stratton Mountain. And when I got up there, it was raining, and um, there was a lot of construction going on. I talked to a few people, and they were all packing up to go home. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got up here late. And nobody had heard. They said, you're looking for somebody? I said, yeah, I'm looking for, you know, my brother-in-law, Rick, and Rick Franlick, and nobody heard of his name. They said, where is he from? I said, he's from Swanton. And they said, well, some of the guys stay up here on the mountain in these condos, and then some stay down the hill at the avalanche. Did you see the avalanche? I said, yeah, I saw it. I drove by it. And they said, well, you know, check in there. I said, okay. So I drove back down the mountain. I happened to be in the 7 I stopped at the 7-Eleven. That same guy came up to me, and he said, did you look at the avalanche? And I said, not yet. I'll probably stop on my way back back to Albany and so I left and I really wasn't going to stop and then I thought well I need to just go ahead and pull in so I did 
And when I walked in, it was a Chinese restaurant. And I'm like, what? There's no rooms here. And this lady said, who are you looking for? And I said, well, I heard you had rooms for rent. I'm looking for my brother-in-law. She goes, yeah, we have rooms. You have to go talk to the guy. He's in the bar. Go into the bar and talk to him. He rents the rooms out. So I walked in the bar, and this guy said, who are you looking for? And I said, "Um, my brother-in-law. What's his name? I said, "Um, Rick Franlick. And he said, Big Rick? I thought, well, I'll go along with that. Yeah, and that's what we called him anyway is Big Rick. So I said, yeah, and he said, does he work for DUW? And at that time, I had no clue at all. And I just said, yeah, I'll go along with that too. He said, I just signed him in two minutes ago. I'm thinking, there's a lot of Ricks in the world that that chance it's the right one. He says, pull out this driveway, go into the next driveway, and um, he's in the first room. So I pulled out the and went into the other driveway, and uh, there was a black truck with a guy with black hair. Rick does not have black hair. He's got reddish blonde. And uh, he's standing in front of the truck, and I went to the end of this bunch of rooms, and I'm sitting there staring at the guy. And I thought, well, you might as well go up and pull up behind him and see if he knows Rick. It looks like he's waiting for somebody. So I pulled up behind that car, and lo and behold, Rick came out of the room, and I just couldn't believe it. And he came up to my car, and we started talking, and I asked him if he would um, go in the bar and have a drink with me. or And he said, yeah, sure, let me send this guy on his way. We were going to dinner. So between that two minutes that guy just said he signed him in and me going to that room, he was leaving for dinner. I mean, I literally had a five-minute window of opportunity there. Rick went and cleaned up, and I went to the bar and waited for him, and then we sat there and talked a couple hours. Most of that conversation, Erica wasn't brought up. It was just about little Ricky. And um, Rick's always been real nice when he's talked to me. He's never been angry or mad or anything like that. And uh, I was the place that always had the family dinners and everything. And Rick knew that. And so, you know, he was always cordial with me. So we talked about little Ricky. And I, at one point I even asked him what, when did you get off the drugs, Rick? And he said about five years ago, his aunt Teresa said that she never could get a feel for about Rick with Erica because he just stared off into outer space and he never let on when Erica's name was mentioned anything. But I noticed that every time that we were talking about little Ricky, that it felt like, you know, there was guilt in the way he, you know, was raising him and the problems he had with him. Rick's head kept going down. And that's when he told me the story about the boys when they grew up beat the dad and the mom still slept with him after that. So Rick's basically the one that told me about all the violence in his family. He told me, you know, more than I even knew. I already knew that Erica and Rick's relationship was extremely violent at the time. Erica had a good temper, too. People on drugs don't do right by anybody, not even themselves. Then we went to another restaurant to eat dinner, and I waited till after dinner, and I said, you know, Rick, I do have to bring up Erica. He said, okay. So, um... We were talking about Erica, and he was telling me that Erica cheated on him and, you know, that she was on on drugs. And um, at one point, I just looked over at him, and I said, Rick, there's nothing that you can tell me that I don't know about Erica and her temper and the drugs. So why don't you let me tell you about the little girl before the drugs? At this time, I'm just trying to say anything, you know. So then finally I got to the part where you told me that you took her to a bus station and you said our I love yous and goodbyes. I said, now, Rick, that's not true. Because that girl that would say I love you and goodbye and let go that easy is me, not Erica. I said, this is what I think happened. I said, I think you killed her. You guys got in a fight, and she ended up dead. And I think you killed her, 
and that's what I feel. His head went way down, and he turned beet red. His face turned red, his arms, his hands, everything turned red. He didn't deny it, he didn't admit to it. 